It's impossible to do series on controversy in gaming without addressing the infamous Resident Evil 6. It's obvious I'd make my way to this game eventually, and I figured now rather than later would be a good time to look into just what happened with this title. It's obviously a game that was intended to combine horror aesthetic and the general populace. You can find exact quotes from the development team which state directly, and verbatim, by Hiroyuki Kobayashi, One of our original goals was to create a horror game, of course, but we wanted to create what we're calling horror entertainment, which is a bad sign of things to come, and thus the theme of this episode of Investigaming. Episode 4, Resident Evil 6. Starting, of course, where I normally do, we look into the goal of the game and its intended audience, and unfortunately for this entry, it seems that the intended audience was so wide, so ambitious, and so intent on capturing everyone that it failed to solicit even average involvement in the title's story. That said, Capcom initially expected a 7 million copy sale within two months of the release of the game, lowering it to 6 million after mediocre reviews following the demo's release, and revealing a mere 806,000 copies were sold in the US of the 4.5 million copies that shipped worldwide, which in itself was a record for the company at the time. Despite this economic inconsistency, we're not here for money, we're here for the content, more specifically the lack thereof in the case of what was changed, cut, or removed before the final product was released to audiences. Keep in mind that this was made on the MT Framework Engine with a development team of roughly 600 members and a runtime of roughly 21 hours. So what made this bad? The broad audience it tried to encapsulate, taking inspiration from Resident Evil 3, 4, and 5, but taking those concepts and sprinting in opposite directions. For example, if you're a fan of Resident Evil 3, play Jake and Sherry's campaign. If you enjoyed 4, play Leon's story. And of course, for an expanded, action-packed variation of 5, play Chris's story. That all culminated in the addition of Ada Wong's story. All in all, it tried to be everything, and thus it became... nothing. Alright, enough stalling. On to the cut content. The original story of the game didn't vary all that much from what was received. The concept of this previously unheard of C-Virus as an altercation of the well-known T and G-type viruses was apparently, or at least from what I could find, always the plan. As well as the, in my opinion, unnecessary addition of longtime protagonists, and as of yet completely unknown and unfleshed out characters like Pierce Nivens, who we know from... Or, uh, Helena Harper, who we all remember from... Okay, okay, what about Jake Mueller? Albert Wesker... Wait, 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 what? Okay, so for some reason, we're taking a man who was so self-centered, self-assured, that he actively vindicated himself with his sheer narcissism and giving him an illegitimate superhuman child who can access the progenitor virus like a super serum in an MCU story. Alright, so the decision to take no names, prior heroes, and villains and mash these storylines together turned the overall game into a kind of mess, but looking past all that, we got introduced to the big bad, Richard Simmons. Wrong guy. Derek. That's his name. Derek Simmons. Very different. Anyways, turns out that Simmons was also not from anything previously, is also the National Security Advisor. And the reason the President of the United States was afflicted with the sea virus. Oh, the President! Obviously President Gra Benford. President Adam Benford. Who we've never met before, and isn't actually Graham's father. Because this is in 2012, and that took place in 2004. Alright, so we've established that while the story didn't change, it did somehow manage to change key elements of characters and lore to such a large extent that we're now introduced to several concepts, characters, plotlines, viruses, out of the blue, with no real build-up to their introduction. We barely know where they came from, except that apparently the Simmons family line has been involved with bioterrorism for literal centuries, dating back almost as far as Mother Miranda and her troop. I really hope that isn't actually a plot line down the road. Regardless, we learn here that Simmons has way too much of a parasocial relationship with Ada Wong to the point that he literally clones her to make Carla Radames. So the real plot is convoluted and weird enough that the cut content really wouldn't change how unsalvageable this story is. Especially given how starkly different each character's plot is. They all interweave and connect at various points in the plot, so jarringly so that you often jump around from year to year, especially in Chris's plot, so much so that you end up losing real track of the timeline of events, or at the very least the will to continue carrying. So what actually did get cut from the game then? Well, during the demo it seems that the camera was much more uncomfortable, with the character standing predominantly in frame and actually causing visual block from the scene itself seemingly mimicking the angle of Resident Evil 4, but in a much more inconvenient way that simply blocked too much of the player's field of view. This was addressed and resolved in the final build, and to be honest, to the game and dev team's credit, the camera angles and scenery do their job. Everything does look great and sound good, even as much as the padded out time, quick time events, scripted downtime sections, gameplay to me, did feel rather well put together, and even in some cases, fun. 
mostly if you had a partner to play with. Now, a lot of the content was censored for international media and release, but that's not the type of thing I look for in these videos. Here, we look for things that don't show up in the game at all. For example, with only a little digging, I found three unused creatures and their initial concept designs. Now, some of them don't have official names, that's just how it goes. So, I'll be naming them myself. This lovely fly guy, trademark, was aptly named Flying Creature or Flying Enemy, and seems to denote a similar build to the Juavo during the earlier segment of Chris's story, with the Grasshopper variations being similar type, and the Hanging Juavo being the seemed replacement for the Fly Guys. Personally, I think the Plume Moth design here would have been really cool to see in-game. Not so much a fan of the G-Virus appendage sprouting from the normal enemy archetypes, although it is neat to see where you damage them, altering their mutations. Next on the list of cut creatures is the aptly named Mollusk, aside from it deriving from the C-Virus, and apparently walking in an awkward fashion similar to someone walking on their hands, not much is known about this guy. Kinda reminds me of the Hunter from Dead Space. Kinda interesting to imagine it running around, but instead we got... Biological Chainsaw. Last but not least is the so named Tortured, supposedly sent lice after its victim from a medium range. Kinda neat, especially since we can see the remnants of its design in the final game, in the form of the Nesdo, or as I like to call them, not the bees. Yes, I know they're bloatflies or something similar, but I like bees. Shut up. So, that concludes the cut content and alternate choices of the game. But what about the development process? How did that go under the direction of... Ichiro Sasaki? Wait, that's the guy that did Outbreak. Okay, well, before he did Resident Evil 6, Mr. Sasaki did both Outbreak games, and just before that, he did Zack and Wiki. Which, as some of you may know, I actually have no clue what this game is, but it seems like an early Wii title. Huh, year after the Wii launched, we got Zack and the Wiki. Neat. Back to the development cycle, which I'm currently avoiding on my own title. We'll get to that later. To quote... We believe that the new challenges we tackled at the developmental stage were unable to sufficiently appeal to users. In addition, we believe there was inadequate organizational collaboration across our entire company with regard to marketing, promotions, and creation of plans and other activities. And yes, I use the Oxford comma to write these. Sue me. Please don't actually. I'm broke. Well, ironically enough, the issue with this game seems to be they didn't delay it enough. It was set to launch in November of 2012 and instead launched in October of 2012. So the real issue is that it seems like the team lacked communication and rushed the title to try to, as stated earlier, encapsulate the entire gaming audience, and thus put far too much into a game that really didn't need that much, stepping far and away from the survival horror genre and into this horror entertainment thing they were going for. So, why did Resident Evil 6 fail? Put quite simply, and in my humble opinion, it tried to be everything instead of doing what it knew it could. The leads in charge of the project were trying to make a magnum opus, but instead fell short, flying too close to the sun. And as we all know, flying too close to the sun can only ever result in being burned. But that failing is what led Capcom back into the limelight with the 2016 release of Resident Evil Biohazard, or more commonly Resident Evil 7, which we'll discuss next time on Investigaming. But thanks everyone for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Until next time, I've been Slade, you've been the audience, and this has been Investigaming Episode 4, Resident Evil 6. Peace out.